Shalom friends, welcome to another Shi'ur in Tanya, written by the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnir Zelman of Niadi, also known as the Sefer Shel Benonim, which is a book describing the nature of the average soul, not the Tzaddik, not the Rasha, and the way in which the average soul interacts in this world, works on itself, improves itself, and so on and so forth. I'm Eliyahu Shir from Chesed Be'emet. My website can be found on www.lovingkindness.co. We're on chapter 19. I hope that you will enjoy this next shiur. We're continuing our story from chapter 18. It's a flow. It continues onwards from the previous chapter. We were discussing the nature of a certain type of love that even a Jew who is not a tzaddik and even a Jew who is not a benoni, really, of course, we want to work on that level to become a Benoni. But even a Jew who's not the Benoni has a means to tap into a love of Hashem that rests with inside himself. Because the book of the Tanya is based upon this Pasuk, which says that the Torah is very close to one, in your heart and in your mouth to do it. And the question is, how is it so close to each one of us? How do we tap into it? So we learned in our last lesson that this comes from the forefathers. The forefathers, by being our ancestors, were able to give and in inherit, to cause us to inherit the love that they had for Hashem, they were able to bring down to us. Now, as we come down to this chapter over here, we need to learn a little bit more about this love. We need to find out what the love really is all about. And we also need to tap into the area of how to implement the concept of the fear, which should also exist as part of the love. It is insufficient to have only a love of Hashem. There also needs to be the concept of fearing Hashem. So let us look at this chapter and see how it describes what this type of love really is all about. To describe onwards in more detail, we have to understand, we have to describe well that that is written a pasuk that says in Mishlei, Perek Chaf, Pasuk Chaf Zion, that's chapter 20, verse 27. Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam. The candle of God is the soul of man. I'm just going to share something briefly over here, which we're going to see in more detail as we progress. But this is a very fascinating verse. Because the word ner, nun, resh, is actually an abbreviation for the two lowest soul levels that we have inside ourselves. The first is called nefesh, and the second is called ruach. So the ner Hashem is actually referring to these two lower levels. The nefesh and the ruach is the nishma sadam, is the soul of man. So there's a play on the words over here in the sentence. Perush, this means, She Yisrael hakruyim adam, that the Jewish people who are called adam, the Jewish people are known as man, nishma sam hi lemashal, their soul is as an example to be compared to, ko'or haner, like the light of a candle, she misna neya tamid lemaila betivo, that it begins to move upwards, it's flickering and moving about constantly upwards by its very nature. This is the nature of the soul. It is to be compared to a candle. Just as we see with the candle that the flame continues to flicker and it moves upwards in its direction of, flick of, of flickering, so too this is the nature of the Jewish soul. It is constantly in a state of flickering within the body, desiring ultimately to reach the higher level, attaching itself to the highest source. The Yesod HaEi which is in corresponding to the foundation of fire, of general fire. Shetachas Galgal HaYareach, which is underneath the hemisphere of where the moon is. And as we learned before in Tanya, right at the beginning, there are four main elements in creation. There's the earth, there's water, there's the air, and there's fire. Now, the earth is on the very bottom, and the water is above the earth. The only reason that waters are found on the same level of the earth and going downwards is only on account of God's kindness, in which he commands the water 
to be below the ground. If not for that, the waters would completely flood the entire earth and none of us would be able to live. So therefore, although it is that the waters as we see them are below the earth, the reality is that water is in fact above earth. Earth is the lowest element. Everything moves towards the very bottom of the earth, the lowest level, the, the laziest level, the most gross materialistic level. Above the water, we have air. And above the air, we have fire, which ultimately goes to the higher levels of the hemisphere. So what happens over here is that the desire of the patella, of the, the, the desire of the light, is that it moves and flickers about constantly upwards by nature. Because it's the nature, it is the nature of fire. Chofet's pativa. Its desire is liparet mehapetila, that it wants to separate itself from the wick, the lidabek peshoshola maila, and it wants to go upwards, the yesodha eshaklali, in the foundation of the fire, of general fire, which is underneath the hemisphere of the moon. Galgal hadyarech, chitachat galgal hadyareyach, kemoshe kasuf eitzchayim, as it is written in the eitzchayim. And he continues to tell us that even though it is that through this, it will be ultimately extinguished, and it will not give any illumination whatsoever, down below. And even above in its very roots, its light is going to be nullified. In its existence, in its roots, Aval P. Cain, even so that that's the case, but that is what it wants to do by its very nature. Let us understand what happens with fire. Fire is fascinating. The candle is fascinating. We have over here a light that exists on top of the wick of the candle. And what does the light ultimately want to do? It wants to separate itself from the wick in order to arise and go upwards to where it wants to meet up in its source of fire. Where is the fire? This is what we're saying. The earth is at the bottom. The waters are above the earth. The air is above the waters and the fire is above the air. It is the nature of something, of something that exists to always want to return to the source from where it came. Since it is that fire is so much higher up in the hemisphere, it is the nature of all fire to flicker towards that place of where it really exists, its source. Now, the amazing thing about this fire of the candle is that it doesn't want to leave the source for its own sake. Because the moment that it leaves its source, all that will happen to it is that it will be absorbed directly back into its very place of where it came from. When it leaves the candle, I mean, in other words, the source of where it currently is at, it is currently attached to the candle, its source now, but it wants to arise and go upwards towards its real source up in the higher hemisphere. When it does so, it will lose two things. One, it will lose its own freedom. It will lose its own essence. It will lose its own individuality. And two, when it ultimately touches its source, it will be so consumed within the source, it will have no effect on anything else below. So for example, if we take a, a candle, we take a light, a match, and we place that match or that candle in the middle of the sun, nobody will see the candle or the sun because the sun is too bright. So the point is that when the light from the fire comes from this candle and goes upwards, it loses its individuality, number one, and it becomes so absorbed within its source, in the heat of the fire, in its source, in its root, that it is no longer able to have the effect on all of the world and bring light into the world as it once was when it was attached to the candle. So that's what we said. Even though through this it's going to be extinguished, and then it won't be able to give any light below. And even then in its source above, it's going to be nullified. The light will be completely nullified in its very source, in its very existence. 
Afal Pikain, even though so, that's how it is. The Kahukhofet Petivo, that's what it wants in its nature. What does that have to do with the soul? What does that have to do with the nature of the love that is inside the heart of the Jew that he can tap into at any point in time in order to love Hashem? Kach Nishma Sa'adam, so too the same thing occurs with the soul of a person. And so too this happens with the Ruach V'nefesh. Yeah, we see the hint. Resh and Nun. That is the Nair. That is the Nair of a person is the Ruach and the Nefesh. What is its desire? Chetza V'chasheka B'tiva. Its desire and its yearning in its nature is Lipareid V'latzeitz Min HaGuf. It wants nothing less than to separate itself and to exit from the body and it will cleave to its very root and to its very source. The desire of the soul is in a constant fluctuating movement within the body, desiring nothing less than to be separated from the body at all times in order to return to its source, the true fire of existence, meaning God, so to speak, this fire. Bahashim, Chaya Chayim, in Hashem, the life of all life, Baruch Hu, blessed is He. Now listen to the story. Even though it will be that when the soul desires this, it is ultimately going to become, it is going to turn into absolute nothing, absolute zero. And it's going to be nullified there. The Metzios Legamri, totally in the existence of God, in other words, it will be completely nullified from its essential existence to be absorbed into the light of God. And there will be nothing left of it, nothing at all. From its first existence and essence. Nevertheless, so. This is its will and its desire by its nature. Those of us who listened into the Shi'ur in the Talmud that we were learning about this past week will remember the story of the four rabbis who enter into the deeper secrets of Torah. They enter into the pardes, into the orchards of Torah, the deeper secrets. And we know that only Rabbi Akiva came out alive. Why did Rabbi Akiva come out alive? Because he was able to get into the light of God, this tremendous existence of of warmth and light and power and energy. But he was so much in control of himself that he ultimately knew that his job in this world was what he had to do over here. And therefore he returned back to his body in peace. He entered in peace, loving Hashem, and he returned back in peace, loving Hashem. However, there was another rabbi who entered the same secrets of Torah, and his name was Rabbi Shimon ben Azai, known as ben Azai, without the first name Shimon. And he also entered into the paradise of Torah. And what does the Torah say about him? What, what did he end up doing? He ended up getting lost in the light of Hashem, and he did not return back to his body. Why not? Because he desired the divine ecstasy. His soul desired nothing less than to cleave to God in this divine ecstasy, in this absolute clinging. He wanted nothing to do with the physical world any longer. Once he was exposed, once the fire of this candle was exposed to the fire of God, it wanted nothing less than to totally cleave to God and not return back to the body. And so he did. He expired in divine ecstasy. One of the very principles that those who study Kabbalah know that those who go too deep into it can end up into a state of never returning because a person who is not in complete control can ultimately exit his body and become so enamored by the love of God towards him and he sees this light and he sees this fire and he knows that he's a portion of it, wants nothing less than to be absorbed into the portion. What will happen to him? Number one, he will lose his identity. Number two, he will be unable to exert the influence that he once had as an individual spark and candle within this world. The Tevazeh and this nature, Hushem Hamushal, it is a borrowed name, Lechol Davar, for everything. Ta'am V'da'at, anything that exists within a realm that has no, it has no reason, 
and ho- has no knowledge to it, the gum can, so too over here, hakavana, the intention is, she rats on the chifet zeh, this desire, and this want and desire, benefish of the soul, a no bebechinas ta'am bedaas, is not within the aspect of reason and knowledge, beseichel musag umuvan, and an intelligence of a comprehension and understanding, Ella, but rather, lemala mehadaas, this love that we were speaking about, that a Jew has towards Hashem, the love found in the heart of every Jew as a gift that was given to him from the forefathers is a love that goes above the da'as, the seichel hamusag v'hamuvan. It goes above knowledge. It goes above intelligence and comprehension that can be understood. In other words, the love that every Jew can tap into is a love that exists within him simply because he is who he is. It is not because he's a tzaddik who is able to rule over his heart. It is not because he's a benoni and he can use his tavuna, his understanding, to be able to think about certain things in order to bring the love upon himself. But where does that love exist, as we learned in the previous chapter? It exists in the realm of chokhmah, if, we see, if you remember from before. Chokhmah is above all of this. It's a sefira which is attached completely to Hashem. This is the aspect of the Chochmah which exists in the soul, which exists above the Da'as, which exists above the Bina. It's a natural part of him. Sheba or Ein Sof Baruchu. And in Chochmah, that is where we find the light of the Infinite One. Blessed is He. If we look into the Sefirah of Chochmah, we find God manifest in His fullness in that Sefirah. That is a part of ourselves. It is the highest sefirah which exists within each of us. And what happens is, whether we tap into it or not, whether we know about it or not, it exists there all the time. And that is why, as we learned before in the previous chapter, as we're going to discuss further on, as we continue, that we see that a Jew can forfeit his life. He can give up his life under the duress of a death sentence from somebody who tells him to worship idols or to kill somebody else, God forbid, any of these things. And the Jew says, I will rather give up my life than end up murdering another Jew, murdering another person. I will rather give up my life than serve those idols and convert to your religion. What makes him do it? This is the internal love that exists within the Sefirah of Chochmah, way above the other Sefirot. It is a natural love, like the love, like the light, like the power, of a candle, of the flame that is flickering upwards all the time. And if you would just give it a chance to leave this candle, it would immediately expire and find itself completely absorbed into the higher fire of the higher hemispheres in this world. And this is a rule, the whole Sitra Kedusha, in all the sides of holiness. We're talking about holiness. We're not talking about its opposites. Within holiness, holiness is something that comes from Chochmah. It must come from the source where God is present. Whenever we're involved in an act of holiness, it is because we're absorbing the energy that comes from the Sefirah of Chochmah, in which God manifests himself, which is above all of our way of thinking. If we have to think too hard, we can change our minds about doing certain things. But when we're attached to the source of goodness and holiness, we immediately act out upon it because that's who we are intrinsically. Shenikra is Kodesh and this is called the supernal holiness. Habatel the Bibetios Boor Ein Sof Baruchu, which is nullified in the existence of the light of the Ein Sof, blessed is he. Hamelubash Bo, and God is enclosed in the Sefira of Chochmah. It is not the thing of its own accounting, as we said above. And therefore, Nikra, it is called Chochma, which is Koach Ma. Chochma is Chaf, is Chet, Chaf, which is Koach, which is Chach, Ma. Koach Ma, which means the strength or the potential or the power of what? 
What is this? That is what Chokhmah is. What is this? That is what Chokhmah is. We don't know what it is. When we look at it, we say, what is it? That is what Chokhmah is. It is the very potential of what can exist. If we take, for example, the seeds of a human being and we look at the seeds, we cannot imagine for one second what the seed really is. This could be a human being which has bones and muscles and limbs. It has eyes and ears and it can achieve all sorts of things in this world. But what will it look like? And how will it act? How will it behave? When one looks at the seed, one can't see it. But it is all there inside the seed. This is the koach ma. Everything is hidden within it. But when we look at it, we can't understand it. That's okay. There's nothing to understand. No human being has to understand the power of a drop of seed, of semen, in order to understand that when there is a process of intimacy between a man and a woman, this can form a child. It has the potential to form a child. Nobody has to dissect the seed beforehand to see whether or not the child will come out in a certain way. Rather, we know that within the seed is the power of the child that will come about. And this is exactly the opposite of the concept of what we speak about, of the klipa, of the husks, of the shells, of the peels, and the sitra akra, the other side. Shemimena, which means to say the side of uh, unholiness, the side of impurity. Shemimena nefashos umasa olam, that from it the souls of the nations of the world come from. The avdin legarmahu, that they do things for themselves, for amrin, and they say, have, have which is the Aramaic words as the Zohar brings down as give, give. The difference between Kedusha and the difference between Tumah is that Kedusha is something that says, I am who I am from the existence of God and I act out with this power. But the nature of Tumah is to say, I am what I am because you will give, give, give. I want, I want, I want. The more I want, the more I can be. But the nature of Tahara, of Kedusha, is I am who I am for my very existence. I do not have to ask, give me, give me, give me all the time. Vahalitaini, and as Asaph said to his brother Yaakov, when he, when he asked him for the soup that he was making, the lentils that he was preparing for him, and he said to, him, and he said to his brother Yaakov, pour it down, just give me all of the soup, give me all of these lentils. Lios, because she yesh, yesh bedava bifnei atzmo. Because these people are in the realm, like the klipa, of something which has its own existence to itself, as we mentioned above. Hefech bechines hachokma. All of this is the opposite of wisdom. Wisdom is the aspect of absolute humility, where I accept everything that I am, because that is what God has made me to be. But when I act on the side of impurity, I say, give me, give me, because I am not who I am from my own existence. I am who I am because of the things that I'm going to get. Give me more so that I can become more. The nature of Kedusha is, I see the holiness of God as it exists within the Sephira of Chochmah. There is a something that exists, which I cannot identify with. But that is the holiness. And therefore, the Rishayim, the wicked people of the world, those who follow in the direction of the Sitra Akra, who says, here I am, like Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, the Nile is mine and I made myself. Those are the words of Pharaoh. The Nile is mine and I made myself. What does Moshe say? Moshe was the most humble man on, on, the, on, the, on the world, of the earth. He's a person who says, but, but who am I? Who am I to take out the Jewish people from Egypt? Who am I? Pharaoh says, not only am I somebody, he says, I made myself and the Nile is mine. I made the Nile. I am in charge of everything. That is the nature of Sitra Akra. The moment a person says to himself or he says to others, I have achieved this. I have done this. That is the Sitra Akra. But when he says, who am I? What am I? Where do I come from? This is the nature of Kedusha. And therefore, these people who are following the ways and, and, and the Klippah and the Sitra Akra, all of this is called Mesim, 
did. Why? Ki, because the Pasuk says in Kohelet, Zayin, Yud Beis, HaChokmet It is Chokmah that gives life. When one links in and connects with the Sefirah of Chokmah, he connects with life itself. If he doesn't connect with the Chokmah, he is therefore considered to be dead, according to the words of Shlomo HaMelech in the book of Ecclesiastes. Okasiv, and it is written in the book of Eov, in the book of Job, Perik Dalet, Pasuk Chaf Aleph, chapter 4, verse 21. Yamusu, they die, but without wisdom. When a person doesn't have wisdom, there is death. Life is from the Chokmah, from the wisdom. Death is when one, when one ignores the wisdom. Now he continues and says, So to the wicked, Yisrael, and all the sinners of the Jewish people, those who are not committed to the way of life, of the observance of mitzvot, the study of Torah, and the fulfillment of these mitzvot, the Poshe Yisrael, they are not fulfilling what they should do. They are rebellious sinners. Now listen to this. Before they come into the realm of uh, a test, the Kadesh Hashem, that they're going to sanctify God's name. So in other words, before this Jew comes to the test of sanctifying God's name, that he will give up his life, he behaves in this way of a manner of death, of acknowledging himself in the sense of, I am who I am. I have made myself. All the strength that I have has made for me everything that I have. That is how the Russia talks. Whatever I do is from the power and the strength of my hands, whereas the Jew who understands God says ultimately everything comes to me from God. Because the aspect of the wisdom in the soul, in the godly soul, with the spark of godliness, may all ain't so baruchu from the light of the Ein Sof Blessed is He, Hamelupash Ba, which is enclosed within it, Heim Belichinas Galus Begufam, they are in the aspect of being in exile within their body. In other words, at this point in time, so long as the Jew has not yet connected with the Chochmah, which exists there, he is going to continue to act in this behavior, whereby he sins against God, because he acknowledges himself in the sense of the Sitra Akra, Everything is mine. I have to do everything on my own. And therefore, the Chokhmah sits within him in an aspect of exile. The Ein Sof is in exile within him. Benefesh Abahamis, in the animalistic soul. Mitzada Klippa, on the side of the husks, of the shells, of the peels. Shebechalal Asmali, which is in the left side. Shebelev, of the heart which is ruling and reigns over their bodies, which is the secret of the exile of the divine presence, as we mentioned above. In other words, when a Jew has not yet acknowledged and is not yet living on that level of the revealed love in the sense that like the tzaddik is ruling completely over his heart or the benoni is using his tvuna to bring up the love, so what happens to him is that he only has this love that exists in the Sefirah of Chokmah. But if he's not in tune with it, then what happens to him is that he ends up being in the realm of the Sitra Akra. But what happens afterwards? And therefore, this for this love which is in the godly soul is called that its desire and its will is to cleave to Hashem. The life of all life. Blessed is He. The love is called by the name of Ahava Mesuteret. It is a hidden love. What does it mean that the love is hidden? It means that there is garbage that is surrounding the love. And the love has been hidden away inside him. And that is why he can't get to it. Because the love is in exile within himself. Because it is, it is hidden. And it is enclosed 
within a sackcloth, when the garments are the top of a sackcloth, the clipper, in the husk, in the evil forces, the poshe Yisrael, of those who commit sins amongst the Jewish people. And from it, there enters into him the spirit of folly, which causes him to sin. The love is present, but the love is hidden amongst all of this garbage. And therefore, as a result of this, this ruach shtut, this foolish folly that enters into him, the spirit of folly enters into him and causes him to sin. And what? He doesn't even realize that the sin that he is doing is tearing him away from God. And he thinks that he is still connected to God because he loves God, he says. And he feels that the connection is still there. But as far as God is concerned, God has already separated himself from this person. The sin causes the separation. When it comes to the laws of Mukta and Shabbos, and a Jew goes and he moves the Mukta about, he moves the pen about, and he thinks to himself, this does nothing, but it does do something. What does it do? It creates a separation between me and God. Why? Because the Torah says that the laws of Mukta have to be fulfilled. Therefore, a person should be aware that even though he doesn't feel the separation, the separation is occurring. What is different about this person and the person who gave away his love for Hashem, even though he was a, a sinning person and he went against Hashem's will, but when it came to the moment that he gives up his life, he gives up his life indeed, even though he did many things wrong in his life. What is different about him to this person over here? How come he was willing to give up his life? Because at that point in time, the love of the Chochmah inside that Chochmah woke him up and made him realize that if I don't give up my life, I will be separated from God forever. And I don't want that. And he therefore intrinsically, automatically, gives up his life for God. The trick, of course, now is for the Jew to be able to internalize this concept so that likewise, when any Avera comes his way, he's able to think in the same way. That when he does that Avera, it causes a separation between him and God. The spirit of folly convinces him that he will still remain connected to God, but ultimately he loses that connection. Ukama Marazal, as our rabbis have said in the Gemara Sota, Daf Gimel Amud Aleph, it says over there, Ein Adam Chayte, a man does not sin, Ele im Kain Niknas Bo Ruach Shtus, unless there enters into him a spirit of folly. When the spirit of folly enters into him, literally it could be a spirit, could be some sort of a force that enters into him and convinces him that he should commit this particular Avera. Ela Shegalus Hazeh, but this exile, Lebechinas Chochma, in the aspect of wisdom, it only goes to the aspect that extends from it into the soul in order to give it life. However, the root and the main part of this aspect of wisdom, which is in the godly soul, who bemochin? That is in the mind. And it does not enclose itself within the garments, in the sackcloth garment, in the klipa, which finds itself on the left side of the heart. The bikinus galus mamash, in the aspect of galus, in reality. But what happens is, it exists in the realm of sleeping in the wicked. And it does not exert its work in them. All the while that the Rishaim are occupied in their minds and their understanding in the desires of this world. So long as the Rasha is involved in the desires of this world, the Chochmah goes into Galut and hides away from the Jew and makes him think that he is independent of God, and he can do whatever he wants. And even if he goes against God's will, God will love him, and God does love him, for sure. But that doesn't deny the fact that when he commits the Avera, he causes a separation. But the Jew imagines that the separation has not been made. And he thinks that when he does something that is against God's will, that he is still okay. 
and he's still connected with God. We will learn more about this in our next lesson as we summarize this last teaching very briefly about the concept of being asleep and how being asleep is not necessarily the truth of what the reality is and how once it wakes up, we can see the truth for what it really is. Thanks for joining me. I'm Eliyahu Shear from Chesed for Emet, our website www.lovingkindness.co. If you've enjoyed this shiur, you have a question about it, whatever you want to uh, ask or discuss, please feel free to make a comment about it. Please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to my channel, click on the bell button and be informed of future shiurim. Please come and check out my site and uh, make a contribution if you're able to, to become a partner in the activities of what we're involved in. I'd be delighted to tell you more about the teachings that we do, the learning that we do. And of course, if you'd like to join a shiur or to become a part of one of these shiurim that are available here online, please feel free to send me an email and I'll be delighted to send you a link and you can join, our, join us for the next shiur. Thanks very much for joining me. I look forward to another shiur in the near future and I wish you everything of the best. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye.